Hey guys, this is your host Gooby, and welcome to the Toon Balloon Podcast, our outlet to discuss, theorize, and enjoy our favorite webtoons with the occasional anime and manga sprinkled in between. In this week's episode of the podcast, we will be discussing several chapters from the incredibly complex webtoon, I Love You by Quimchi. I will be discussing chapters 138, 139, 140, 141, and 142. I am so happy that I Love You has returned from hiatus because I have been so anxious to discuss some of my favorite characters as well as some characters that I express great displeasure for (laughs) and you might know who I'm talking about. There have been many developments since the series has returned and I am so excited to discuss them with all of you. If you have not yet, please consider checking out the creator's Patreon. Quimchi produces wonderful content for her patrons and if you love this series as much as I do, then you will not be disappointed. I will leave all of her links for support in the description box below. Before I jump into discussing each episode, I will supply a short synopsis for each chapter and I will also list out timestamps for each segment so you can locate what you want to hear the most. If you are not caught up with the webtoon yet, go check out those chapters I listed earlier because there will be spoilers in this episode so you have been warned. Now, let's talk I Love You by Quimchi. Chapter 138 centers around Shinei's meeting with Mr. Hirahara. After hearing from Jace that she could possibly get some help from Rand, she decided to go to him in hopes that they could adjust a contract that she signed with Yui. After being informed by Rand that the likelihood of him having any power to change the contract looked grim, Yui materializes out of thin air behind Shinei. Proceeding to give me a heart attack, Shinei then gives Yui an earful after Ran leaves the room. The argument ends with Yui offering to pay for Shinei's tuition for school. Shinei walks out of the room, rejecting her offer. Yui then has to land the last words of this chapter with a, Oh, sweetie, you'll come running back. My first impression with this chapter was the thumbnail. I noticed that the face of Shine was filled with such dread and it really hurts to see her get tossed around by someone like Yui. Oftentimes it feels like Shine is in a minefield within this company. She is always on the edge and any move she makes could trigger yet another explosion of events. It isn't her fault though. She is just placed in unfortunate circumstances that are out of her control and I really feel for her. I do admire her endurance but I truly hope that Shanae can finally have her peace because the girl needs a break. (laughs) Shanae seeks out Rand's help with adjusting the contract she shares with Yui. The way Jace describes how helpful Rand is to others in their last interaction is so similar to how Yujing describes him, that he is kind and that he will help anybody. Rand even paved Yujing's path to obtain the career she has now. I really feel like that Rand is incapable of showing this side of himself to Yui because it feels like he is a completely different person when anyone outside of the family circle describes him. I do feel like he would really try to help Shine if he had that capability against Yui. This chapter highlights a couple of things for me. Yui is in her own league and that is terrifying. Her own husband has no real power against her because this contract only displays one of the many things that Rand is unable to challenge her with. 
It's strange because the guy is the head of the company, yet Yui is pulling strings in the background. The complexities of the relationship is something I would like to dive into for a bit. I do feel that their marriage is a marriage of convenience and status. The two don't show much affection to each other at all, and this is clearly evident in later chapters, and I will touch on that later. It's similar to unions that only occur because two families wanted to become more powerful, and this is often accomplished through marriage. My question is, which side of the family is actually holding power over the other? Even though Rand is the CEO, does Yui's lineage actually hold more weight over him than we think? In this chapter, we can tell that Shanae is in a bit of a pit that she cannot get herself out of, and in no way is Yui going to be letting her out of it anytime soon. I have some suspicions that whatever it is that Yui is trying to get out of Shanae in this whole debacle is similar to what she had done to Alyssa, Yonggi's girlfriend. Or shall I say stand-in girlfriend because that girl definitely does not have Yonggi's best interest in mind, but I digress. <laughs> I feel like Yui is using Shanae as this new puppet and weaponizing her friendship with Yonggi. You ever just find those toxic people in the world who just want to suck all the good things in other people's lives, almost sabotaging any chances that they have at happiness? Well, that, my friends, is definitely what Yui is doing here. <laughs> she does everything in her power to belittle Yonggi. She expresses great disdain for our sweet redheaded boy, and she never acknowledges by his first name. He is only ever referred to as Kid, which is quite disrespectful. Um, he is tethered to this empty relationship with Alyssa that Yui seems to have coordinated herself in order to block any opportunities for Yonggi to find someone who would actually love him. If he tried to step out of that relationship, it could jeopardize the Hidehara image. Therefore, it makes him both unhappy and chained to her plans. But Shanae has been the new target for Yui. Yui can tell how much Shanae's friendship means to Yonggi, and she is weaponizing it in order to make Yonggi suffer even more. She blackmails Shanae with money and the possibility of an education in order to get what she wants out of her. And I think this is similar to how she wrapped Alyssa around her finger by stringing her along with the idea of becoming an idol. The way she just uses people as her personal playthings is so gross and it makes me dislike her so much more. She terrified me this chapter because I feel like not only is her power over others scary, but now she manifests out of thin air. <laughs> I truly hope that someone can stand up to this woman one day because she needs some serious humbling. I also think that maybe Shanae reminds Yui of somebody that she very much disliked, but I will get into that in chapter 142. So let's move on to the next chapter. Chapter 139 starts off with Shine looking over her finances in her room and then comes Minyuk to ask Shine if she would like to play a spoofed version of Super Smash Bros. While gaming, Shine finally puts two and two together and realizes that Yui and Rand are indeed a couple. There is a bit of shock as she realizes that she shares the same taste in men as Yui. Min Hyuk's mom shows up with a letter for Shanae from her supposed sister. The letter contains a photo of Shanae's mother with a baby. The letter asks that Shanae would be willing to meet with her sister every Thursday night. 
Min Hyuk, of course, says that he will be tagging along for Shanae's safety. We then move on to see Kosuke celebrating in Japan with a meal while chatting with his cousin, Hanske, through a video call. The conversation leads to Hanske reminding Kosuke of their privilege. The chapter ends with Kosuke greeting Shanae at work. I could really relate to Shanae in this episode on a personal level when it came to looking over one's budget. Because I know I have had those times where I had to see if I'll be able to keep up with the bills that month. Stuff like that is stressful and I can completely understand why Shanae would consider working at the Hirahara company, even if it kills her, because it would pay the bills. I'm glad that even with all of these added stresses, she has an excellent support system from people like her friend Min Hyuk, and especially his mom. <laughs> he offers to play a spoofed version of Smash Bros, and I think it was a cute way to not get hit by a copyright claim. Super smoosh siblings. <laughs> Min Hyuk is a sweet friend who just wants his friend to have a good time, and I love that they can be so comfortable with each other. They can rage and vent and completely just go nuts with each other, which I think is awesome. And I love that they almost share like a sibling relationship. And the moment Shanae put two and two together and figured out that the Hirahara's are a couple was wild. I was not expecting that reaction out of her. Uh, <laughs> Um, I also can't believe that she didn't notice sooner considering their names and positions. And I'm glad she figured it out now, but dang girl, she freaked out. <laughs> Realizing that she shares the same taste as Yui was so funny, but also I was like, you know what, her reaction is pretty fair. <laughs> also, Shanae, why do you gotta go and talk like you ate this man's balls? I completely forgot what she was referring to here, and I was just as bamboozled as Minhyuk here. <laughs> And thank and thankfully, um, you know, we got some context because I was like, wait, what is she talking about? When did this happen? Did I miss a chapter? <laughs> but you know what? We got some comedy out of it all. Uh, Min Hyuk is here trying to tell Shanae she needs to respect herself and not do um, promiscuous things. <laughs> And also, I love that Min Hyuk's mom is just absolutely swooning over Shanae's dad. Stuff like this is so cute, and I really enjoy the added humor in this chapter. It's a nice break from the drama, but just like Shanae, we cannot avoid the drama because Shanae gets a letter from her supposed sister that includes a photo of their mom, which I am assuming is holding a baby Shanae. I, I don't know about all of you, but isn't her sister a little too suspicious? I feel like if you really wanted to connect with your family, people you haven't seen in forever, then you wouldn't break into their homes and ask to meet alone in very strange places at uncomfortable hours. Like, it is made a point that she wants to meet Shanae at nighttime. I love that Min Hyuk is just as, as suspicious as I am because I definitely don't feel too safe with this whole dilemma. I can't trust the sister yet because I feel like her actions haven't left a good impression on me. I hope that Shanae brings along a friend if she does decide to meet her sister. I worry if she is too trusting, it can backfire on her. Plus, it's good to be a little bit on the safe side. At least for Shanae, because she gets into situations that are pretty rough, and I want my girl to be safe. <laughs> and I think the MVP of this chapter for me is Kosuke's cousin, Hanske. I feel like with his career choice, you know, being a doctor, it really humbled him. And it helped him understand other people's backgrounds. That level of understanding and wisdom he delivered to Kosuke this episode was so necessary. I am not afraid to admit that Kosuke is not one of my favorite characters in the series. 
even after a couple of rereads, I did try to get myself to like, you know, like the guy. And uh, I just, I have a difficult time connecting with this character because I don't think he has developed enough out of that holier than thou attitude of his. You know, he, he says a lot of classist remarks is what I've noticed. And I'm usually not fond of him disrespecting Shanae for like little things like the way she dresses. And he doesn't really consider her feelings when it comes to the many changes he demands out of her. The guy lives in his own world and that can be quite frustrating for me to read because I find that respecting other people is really, really important. Those are fundamentals to being a human being and, you know, being a good friend. And I feel like when I see him disregard others for the way they choose to dress or live, it's a little frustrating. Don't get me wrong. I know he has his moments, but I think he does have a long way to go. Still, <laughs> I am thankful for Hanske's character in this story. When Hanske's mentioned that not everyone shares the same privileges as the two of them. It was a good demonstration of both his character and his influence on Kosuke. I think it says a lot that no matter how odd Hanske appears to Kosuke, because you know he's a weeb and he collects body pillows and stuff like that, he still has a lot of respect for him and takes his words to heart and consideration. Hanske also pushes that it's helpful to be kinder to others because in reality, people respond better to kindness and praise. Everyone has their own hardships and everyone is doing their best to do their jobs. And that little bit of perspective can go a long way to reaching out to others and building better work relationships. Yeah, critique is needed at times, but if that is all you're gonna give to your employees, then you won't get great results and you won't have happy employees in the end. In the next chapters, we get to see him practice when Hanske preaches, so let's get into it. Chapter 140 is about Kosuke deciding to take Shanae out to eat at a fast food restaurant that she enjoys to celebrate both her completing her etiquette classes and also for Kosuke's um, promotion in Japan. They have quite the argument in the restaurant and this leads to Kosuke leaving the table. The chapter ends off with Kosuke showing up with a stuffed beaver toy he won in Japan. Okay, so talk about a rough start. <laughs> I feel like these two have such heavy personalities that clash so roughly with one another. I wanted to take into account one of the topics that one of my Instagram followers suggested I touch on for this episode, the story Tinker asked, is Kosuke redeemable? And I gotta say, I think he still has a chance. <laughs> I feel like any character can be redeemable, but redemption arcs take work. Best example I could put down is Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender, and that will always be my example, guys. If you hear this happen again, it's because it's my standalone one. <laughs> he puts in the work in order to be accepted again by those he hurt, like Aang, Katara, um, Sokka, you name it. I think for Kosuke to really redeem himself, he would need to take just as much measures in order to be accepted again. He would need to apologize to those that he has dismissed in the past. I think what he is doing in this chapter is a step forward. And since he did take what Hanske told him into consideration, I would think that these are baby steps to a bright redemption arc. The question is, what steps will he take to making amends with others? I also feel like Kosuke would be in need of some serious humbling in order to really understand the hardships of others. 
And the question I have for you, my listeners, is do you think his mother is redeemable? I feel like she definitely needed some serious humbling, and I don't even think that would make her change. In this chapter, Shanae and Kosuke discuss his trip to Japan and how he got the promotion. It's sweet of Shanae to mention in her thoughts that she should have gotten him a gift if she had known that he had gotten the promotion. Even if the gift was really small, I think that just tells a lot of her character and how considerate she is, you know, because even if she has a little bit of money, she would still get someone a present if, you know, they had something good to talk about. And that's really nice of her. Kosuke tells her he is here to celebrate her completing her etiquette course as well and hints that celebrating little victories is helpful for people like her. Okay, so this set off a bomb in the minefield and Shanae didn't even have to move. (laughs) So we need to remember that these are baby steps. I do think another thing that Kosuke is going to have to work on after observing this chapter is his communication skills or more so his sensitivity when speaking to others. I feel like that is just something he doesn't really acknowledge because it was just how he was raised. I feel like he can be harsh when he's really just being honest, but there could be improvement with his delivery. I kept wondering throughout this chapter that he was putting in a lot of extra effort to do things that Shanae likes to do, even when he has a distaste for it. And this is particularly referencing his desire to eat a cheeseburger. And, you know, we all know he, he ain't no cheeseburger fan. He all, all he wants to eat is sweets. Like, we can all see him not wanting to do it, but he is trying to push past the boundary that he is usually not comfortable crossing. Eating junk food is one of them, even though eating nothing but sweets doesn't seem much better than eating junk food. He mentions that he wants to know why she would want to leave the company, even though there are great opportunities from the job, which leads to Shanae mentioning that she'd rather not work near those wretches. This stings Kosuke, and he snaps at her and tells her not to call his mom a wretch. So after seeing that, I felt like, He must have heard that a lot, but there must be a source to hearing that specific word because he snapped pretty badly. I I wouldn't put it past anybody in the workplace to maybe have had that slip in conversation, but I wonder if this is like a familial issue where he may have heard that word in the past. I felt like their argument that followed that outburst highlighted a couple of things. We know that Shanae does not want to work for the company, but we don't really know why Kosuke wants her to stay in the company that badly. I mean, he made it perfectly clear in the past that she was not cut out for the job, and now all of a sudden he is pushing for her to stay. Heck, he even suggests that she will be going to Japan with him. Like, what on earth changed his in his head where he must put in so much effort to make this girl work for a job that she has firmly stated that she does not want to stay in. And I have a couple of thoughts on this. Kosuke most likely could be projecting his own thoughts on the matter because this is something that he has had to do his whole life. He has had to put in so much effort to work for the company because he has been raised since childhood to take over the company, that he will be the heir of this company. It's all he knows and projects this onto others because how could you pass up on an opportunity? This is something you should jump onto because that was what I was taught to do. Another guess for me is that he is using Shanae as a second chance to correct the mistakes he made with his relationship with Yongi. This is something we will tap into more in chapter 142. Now, this chapter ends off with Kosuke leaving the room to grab Shanae her gift. A beaver plush she won in the claw machine in Japan. My first thought when seeing that panel was, okay, how exactly is the beaver going to win Shanae's trust? Well, let's get into that in the next segment.
Chapter 141 starts off with Kosuke handing over the beaver to Shanae as a gift, and the two sort of reconcile. After forcing himself to eat a hamburger, Kosuke insists that they continue to celebrate. To Shanae's dismay, she suggests that they go to the arcade. Kosuke begrudgingly tags along with Shanae and they go to the arcade. Kosuke is having a difficult time to liven up since he finds the arcade gross and dirty. Eventually, someone wipes off like some sweat that lands on Kosuke and he panics. So Shanae is then seen waiting on Kosuke while he washes up in the restroom. The two start to argue yet again when he returns and when they finally calm down, Kosuke begins to describe his childhood to Shanae, which she describes as sad. And the chapter ends off with Kosuke seeing Shanae as a young yongi. So the beaver can represent a few things. And I noticed that a number of observations within the webtoon community were made after Shanae was gifted the beaver. For one, what the beaver symbolizes. Beavers are known for their teamwork skills, hard work, and companionship. This could possibly allude to what Kosuke is seeking out of Shanae, a person to build a team with since he wants her to work with him while he leads as CFO in Japan. Hard work is a pretty good description of Kosuke, but did you also know that beavers have to keep working? Beavers have to constantly chew wood in order to not let their teeth grow too long. Their teeth never stop growing, so therefore they never stop chewing. <laughs> so they must chew in order to sustain themselves. And beavers can work like at least 26 to 29 hours. So they are like the personification of hardworking. Similar to Kosuke, all he does is work and that's all he has ever known. And this is something he mentions in his conversation with Shanae at the end of the chapter. He puts himself on a strict schedule and he followed that schedule every day as a child. And honestly, if he were to take himself off this schedule, could he sustain himself? Would he be able to function without this very strict schedule? Uh, this is something he pushes on his peers as well, to work hard. And I mean, he has been always insistent on making sure he is improving and demonstrating his work. Companionship is also something that he is seeking as well. When I asked my followers what they wanted me to touch on for this episode, Thai Novel suggested this to me. Why did Kosuke identify Shanae as a younger Noel? So both this topic and the representation of companionship go hand in hand. Kosuke has been shown in the series so far. Um, he had futile efforts to connect with Yongi. He seeks companionship and this could be through Shanae, but not so much in like a romantic sense, but more as a friend. I feel like him visualizing her as Yongi at the end of the chapter just tells us what Shanae means to him without saying anything at all. Shanae reminds him of the brother that he failed to connect with. Considering that not only did the two of them share the same response to Kosuke's childhood schedule, but they also share similar personalities. They both love burgers, pranks, and they come from similar backgrounds which are shown in the next chapter. Kosuke does so much to try to have Shanae have more opportunities and for her to appear more presentable in order to fit into his high class living. I think this could have a lot to do with what Yongi lacked growing up with him. Yui, one of the closest people to Kosuke, demonstrates an immense distaste for Yongi and may have shown Kosuke a closer look at what it looked like to shun a person away. Kosuke had a front row seat to seeing Yongi's opportunities being stripped away from him and being treated poorly because of his background. Kosuke attempts to connect with Shanae as a way to make up for those mistakes he made in the past that destroyed his chances at having companionship with Yongi. Thai Novel on both Instagram and Twitter does an incredible job at deep diving into this chapter as well, especially chapter 142. 
If you have not yet, I sincerely suggest you check out her analyses because she goes heavily in depth on the representation of the beaver as well as Kosuke's perception of Shanae. I definitely felt enlightened. <laughs> Plus, I feel like she delivered amazingly great points. Something I also wanted to mention is that whatever it is that Kosuke is seeking with Shanae, it won't exactly mend what he lost with Noel. I think Shanae does offer the opportunity for him to understand that sometimes taking a step back to reflect on himself can really aid him in changing. And with that, we move on to the next chapter. Chapter 142 starts off with my boy Dieter, or Dieter, finding a distressed Shanae alone in the arcade. Shanae is relieved to see one of her friends in the arcade, while Dieter seems a little concerned to see that Kosuke's jacket is near where Shanae was seated. While this is going on, we pan over to find Kosuke cleaning off his face again in the restroom, looking quite alarmed. Uh, this is when we start to see a repetitive sequence of events. Kosuke's childhood. The glimpses of his past demonstrate a strict schedule for Kosuke. He doesn't interact with his friends. He eats nothing but sweets. The boy is reading at an obscene level and we notice a lack of familial affection. Eventually, this repetitive chain of events ends when little Kosuke meets little Yongi for the first time. Kosuke lashes out at Yongi as he sees him as a threat and the chapter ends off with Kosuke seeing Yongi's mother for the first time but her face is scribbled out. Okay, so this chapter is heavy and I will do my best to go over everything I could write a note for. First and foremost, Dieter, or Dieter, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, <laughs> but this dude is always my highlight when he enters a chapter because I am so fond of his character. I really feel like he is just a breath of fresh air, literally. Shanae is able to let loose and breathe when he is around because she felt so much discomfort during this outing with Kosuke. And also, Dieter is also a very observant character. He notices immediately that Kosuke is around and when he sees his coat, but he is also aware of Shanae's discomfort. I like that he pays a lot of attention to her body language because this is something that he notices in that chapter where they went to the movies together. Dieter catered to Shanae's needs and offered comfort when she was uncomfortable during her outing with Kosuke that day. I feel he will also offer her some support in the next chapter since he is essentially a teddy bear. And if Dieter is a teddy bear and Kosuke is a beaver, then what exactly is Yongi? I don't know if there has been an animal that is supposed to represent him yet, but I am quite curious. I noticed that most of the animals that represent the boys in this story always have a chance to come in as like a plush toy. So we might see that soon, or I missed it. I don't know. You guys let me know um, through my messaging stuff later. I'll let you know. Also, this chapter finally gives us a look at Kosuke's childhood which was, as both Noel and Shanae have stated, it was sad. Okay, so as an observation from a parental point of view, because you know, I have two children of my own, uh, Yui did Kosuke dirty. I mean, she allowed that boy to eat sweets constantly, whenever he wanted, for every meal. Like, who does that? Like, a healthy diet is so important for his growth, for any child's growth. And I feel like her never uh, expressing discipline in the sense of just suggesting he eat some variety caused Kosuke to kind of enact his own method of discipline in his life. The strict schedule he gave himself um, 
kind of offered some control in his life since his mother didn't seem to offer any stability since she kind of let him do whatever he wanted, like eating dessert for every meal. And Yui also never allowed Rand to parent his child, considering the few times he would say something, Yui would kind of shoo him away. She would be like, no, 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 don't tell him what to do. I mean, let him eat cake if he wants. He'll be fine. You'll be fine. Uh, and Rand doesn't win dad of the year by all means but in this instance i don't think he could add much input anyways like i don't know if it felt worse because kosuke only ever showed any joy in his childhood when he was eating a piece of cake and the scenes where he was sitting with his parents as a family only began to drift with each repeat at first, Rand is seated with all of them, and later he is unavailable, and Yui is shown frowning, not smiling like the first panel. Kosuke grew up dismissing playtime with classmates so he can study or train or do something adult-like, like play golf with his dad or something. In his free time, he would read books that are quite inappropriate for a child at his age to be reading, and this comment from Aunt Wacky under this episode sums it up quite perfectly. Hmm. Lord of the Flies and Devil in the White City? Interesting, especially for a 10 year old to be reading. The first focuses on a group of British boys stranded on an uninhabited island and their disastrous attempt to govern themselves. The second is based on real characters and events. It tells the story of 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago from the viewpoint of the designers including Daniel Burnham and also tells the story of H.H. H. Holmes, one of America's first serial killers. Just by that comment alone, you can kind of understand that yeah, those books are highly inappropriate for a child his age. And not to mention, they seem quite heavily above his level. Like, I think he's supposed to be 10 years old. And to find that he is reading books that are talking about serial killers of all things is quite odd. Like, what would be needed for him to be reading books like that? And especially since he's reading them in his free time. Like, what kind of benefit would you get out of those? <laughs> Anyways, his schedule and repetitive lifestyle offered some, some comfort to Kosuke, which as he said back in chapter 141, uncertainty causes misery. This kind of hinted that his need for a schedule was his solace as a child. He knew how his day would go and he was comfortable with the consistency. This consistency, of course, comes to a halt the day he meets Yonggi, the day he meets the other woman. Their interactions together had me notice so many things that I felt much more clear after I reread the series. Kosuke was aware of the scandal that his father had gotten into. And that was the fact that he had a whole different life and a whole other family on the side. In fact, when you read the repetitive sequences and the events in this chapter, you can sort of notice that Yui was putting thoughts in Kosuke's head in the blurred out scenes, such as the phrase, he has been wiring money to someone for years. Can you believe that, son? What kind of manipulative parent are you to drag your own child into this mess? Like that is something you discuss with your spouse, not put this on your child. Man, Yui does not quit with using people as her pawns. Anyways, back to the boys' interactions with one another. First and foremost, their attire and body language, because that is really important. Noel is here with the sweetest smile on his face, and he is just embracing Kosuke's presence. He is open, he's not shrugging, he's not standoffish at all. He's even offering a handout to him as a way to offer friendship. Noel is seen with socks and sandals, which odd fashion choice, but we will not acknowledge that. <laughs> Shorts, his shirt tag is sticking out and looking quite comfortable and carefree. Kosuke, on the other hand, is here in his pressed, nicely fitted clothing that look to be of high quality. And he, of course, looks quite dressed up. 
However, unlike Noel, he is standing upright almost to assert his dominance in their meeting. And when Noel comes closer, he backs away almost as if Noel is some sort of fearsome animal. Kosuke expresses why Noel looks like him. And him is obviously their father, Rand. It's easy to tell the similarities between their father and Noel's facial features. Rand is indeed the father. If he went on the Mori show, he, he wouldn't be able to deny the paternity test. He is definitely the father. But Kosuke almost was fooled by Noel's description of Rand that Noel described their dad as funny, kind, sweet, generous and really really weird and i wonder why the weird part was um, expressed so vividly and i hope to see this side of rand one day because i am getting really curious <laughs> and this is also almost the same description that most people have of rand outside the family circle like i mentioned earlier so i know there is some truth to this personality of his although this isn't the father that Kosuke grew up with and is aware of, which is really, really sad. Like, it seems like his own dad was never able to express that side of himself with his own son. His own son only saw him as this man who held up a company. And for all things in this, I blame Yui. <laughs> and although... Uh, Kosuke showed a sigh of relief to hear that this boy's dad is nothing like his own. He was heartbroken to hear that it is indeed the same father. The dead giveaway was those chocolate balls he eats that apparently taste like caca. And I'm sorry, but as a Mexican woman, I thought Noel was saying that those balls taste like poop. And I was very, very confused. And in the end, I was very, very wrong. <laughs> um... Anyways, this leads to Kosuke calling Noel a mistake and that he cannot be the heir to the company. I noticed that one of the first things that Kosuke thinks of is that he could lose his chance of his inheritance, most likely the company, and that thing he has dedicated his life to. This could be devastating for a boy his age, especially one where he skipped out on being a child to hopefully gain a company that he probably you know he couldn't have complete understanding of but was like groomed since birth to like understand that i have to be the head of the company i have to inherit it and he wasn't able to be a child and he sacrificed all of that for something that he could possibly lose and that would be quite um devastating to someone no matter their age of course and like one of the first things in mind is the company and not so much his family not so much his mother like he was more concerned about oh no we're gonna lose the money we're gonna lose this and that and i don't know if that's just because of the way he was raised by yui that that was always the fundamental thing that he had to keep an eye on that he had to always remind himself of it's for the company it's for the company i'm doing all of this for the company of course Yonggi had nothing to do with breaking his parents' marriage. That was something that his parents are responsible for. But Kosuke has been brainwashed to dump all of his hate and disdain on Yonggi, their scapegoat. The poor thing was already this target for hate when he was such a pure ball of sunshine. I wanted to compare something from 141 to 142's scenes where Kosuke and Noel are talking about whether he would be given the broken gamepad. I wanted to point out that the interactions that Kosuke shared with Shanae in chapter 141 almost parallel what happens with young Kosuke and Noel. Kosuke gives Shanae a toy unlike in the past with Noel. Kosuke expresses that people like her need stuff like that toy. He obviously sees their similarities as they both come from similar backgrounds with similar personalities. And these backgrounds included that they didn't have a lot of money. 
Kosuke equates this lack of money to both of them kind of needing things like toys and video games since they couldn't afford them. He makes a point that he is a lucky man. And I feel that in comparison to Yongi, he was luckier since Yongi wasn't able to have those kind of luxuries of having almost every gaming console out there. And instead of throwing his toy away, he gives his new toy to Shine as a gift. And I feel that this first ever interaction he shares with Yongi is always on the back of Kosuke's head and he subconsciously acts out what he wished he had done instead. I also want to draw some comparisons that I mentioned earlier in the episode with chapter 138 that Yui might target Shanae especially because she probably reminds her of someone. And I think this could be Noel's mom. We of course see her face scratched out in the panels. She is shown by the little bit we know of her, um, you know, with the body language. She is quite affectionate and she seems to really care for Rand. I also believe that if Rand is going to seek out another woman, then she is going to have to be the complete opposite of Yui, you know, warm, caring, and compassionate. That's not Yui. <laughs> I, I also think that if she shares any similarities with Shanae, then I think she would be the type to stand up to someone like Yui. I think Shanae might also remind Yongi of his mother because maybe they both shared similar personality traits and that's why he was so drawn to Shanae. I am also only deducing one, like a couple of my theories, but I'd like to think that the woman that Rand chose was someone who could challenge Yui herself, just like how Shanae stands up for herself and isn't afraid to give Yui an earful. So I would think that both of them may be similar in some way. We don't know this yet, of course. This is just me kind of putting my thoughts out there. <laughs> I worry that Yui might have done something to Yongi's mom. He expresses a lot of fear towards that woman, and I fear this could be because of something that she did in the past. Kosuke even blocks her out of his memory, Yongi's mom. So maybe he knows something that we don't. We'll just have to wait and see in future episodes because right now I have more questions than I do answers. <laughs> Although in this chapter alone, we got so many answers and we got a backstory finally. We finally addressed the elephant in the room. We finally addressed the fact that these siblings are in fact in a peculiar situation. But I'm glad that we got a lot of info in this episode. And I was really excited to talk about everything because I had a lot to deep dive on and discuss. And I'm so glad that you all joined me to listen to everything. <laughs> uh, I'd like to take a minute for those of you who offered topics for me to discuss in the podcast. Uh, I love hearing what you all are thinking and theorizing. Please go and check out the Story Tinker and Thai novel as they both produce wonderful webtoon related content. And let me know your thoughts and opinions of what we discussed today in this episode by messaging me through either of my social media handles. Both my Twitter and Instagram handles are at the Toon Balloon. I would love to hear from you. Also, definitely tell me any other webtoons, anime, or manga that you are interested in. I may talk about them in future episodes. The Toon Balloon podcast can be listened to on SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and more. Now, let's end this episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time to listen to my humble podcast. I look forward to talking with you again. This is the Toon Balloon Podcast. I was your host, Gooby. See you next time.